Welcome to the San Gorgonio Chapter Trail Talk series. My name is John St. Clair, and I am your Zoom host tonight. And I'm going to, um, before we get started, go over a few ground rules. Um, first of all, uh, the only people who will not be muted are whoever's speaking at the time, the, the presenter, and then myself and the other committee members uh, as we lead up to the introduction to our speaker. And uh, if you have questions of the speaker, please put it in the chat box. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a little talking bubble that says chat. You click on it and it opens up a box on the right and send it to everybody. And um, Julianne Anderson, who's one of the committee members, the, the Trail Talk committee members, will keep an eye on that and relay questions to the speaker at appropriate times, or perhaps some will be saved till the end of the meeting, but your questions will eventually be answered. Uh, tonight's Trail Talk uh, is a long title. <laughs> it's uh, the Chukwala National Men Monument and Joshua Tree Expansion Project. So uh, next month, we're going to have Brian Shomo of the Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency talk about what his agency is doing uh, to conserve habitat and what the the current uh, issues and problems are. So that should be an interesting talk as well. And I believe it's already been posted, so you can register anytime for that one. And then um, I think that's about it. Oh, the other thing is this is being recorded. And if you have to leave before the meeting's over, uh, or you want to refer this talk to some friends who couldn't tune in tonight, the San Gorgonio chapter has a YouTube channel, and I will be posting that probably tonight, uh, if not then tomorrow morning, and all of our Trail Talk videos are posted on the San Gorgonio chapter YouTube channel, and the um, reminder message I sent out has the link to that YouTube channel channel, so don't throw away that email. At this time, I'd like to introduce Julianne Anderson, who's one of the committee members of the Trail Talk Committee, and uh, Julianne will introduce our speaker. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we are very fortunate to have our own Moises Cisneros uh, speak to us about this very exciting project, the uh, the potential Chikwala National Monument, which is wonderful and astonishing, as you will soon find out. Um, and Moises will talk to us in detail about the potential monument and the organizing that um, has been underway for some time to get it uh, uh, on its feet. And I mean, be mindful. This is this is a, a landmass that is greater than the Joshua Tree National Park. So this is a large potential monument and potential expansion to Joshua Tree. And and we were just musing the other day when we did our practice, you know, Joshua Tree started out as a national monument in the 30s, and then it became a national park when Diane Feinstein and others uh, put together the Desert Protection Act, you know, nearly 60 years later in the 90s. And here we have this wonderful potential monument, and perhaps it will be uh, part of the National Park uh, in less than 60 years, I hope. Well, without further ado, um, I'd like to briefly tell you a little bit about Moises. He is um, our own, our Sierra, Sierra Club's own uh, field organizer. He's been uh, with the Sierra Club for four and a half years, which is astonishing. Um, and uh, as field organizer, he's been working on this monument, uh, and he's also the co-lead of the Inland Deserts Working Group Coalition. Uh, Moises's work is focused on protecting the California desert and its biodiversity. Uh, he's been in this role um, throughout the pandemic and beyond, so uh, it's just wonderful for us to hear about some of the fruits of his labors and, and how he has gone about um, kind of coalescing uh, these community members 
to uh, put this potential monument together so that hopefully we can present it to President Biden and have uh, an executive order and a national monument. Without further ado then, Moises, take it away. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much, Julian. I, I really appreciate that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the work that I've done. And I got to say, I, I'm just riding on a lot of people's coattails, uh, some that are on this call now. Um, it's great to see people that I know. Um, uh, so just a really, real, real honor to be able to work with some amazing people throughout this. Um, and I see, uh, I want to say a shout out to Timothy Scott. Um, thank you for being here and everybody else, just, uh, you know, the work that you do supports, um, uh, the ability for us to move forward with these kinds of projects. Um, well, yeah, so my name's Moises Cisneros, uh, he, him, his, I'm a senior field organizer for the Sierra Club. Uh, and as Julian mentioned, I'm specifically working on protecting deserts in Southern California, uh, I'm also a member of the Protect California Deserts Coalition, working to create this proposed Chikwala National Monument. Um, but today I'm going to summarize briefly some of the components that have gone uh, into creating this proposed national monument, and also discuss why we believe uh, the Chikwala National Monument proposal is a good contender. Uh, along the way, I hope you'll pick up uh, on the why the area would be a great place to visit, hike, and recreate. After all, this is the trail talk. Um, towards the end, you'll have a chance to, to uh, contribute to the, 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 this, the ongoing story of the Chikwala National Monument by um, uh, signing a petition that, we're, uh, that we'll eventually send to President Biden uh, on this issue. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, definitely uh, please consider uh, adding your uh, adding your questions to the chat box. Can everybody see the the full presentation without any other uh, distractions? Is it just like the full slide? Yes, yes, it is. Oh, okay, great. Are wonderful. So uh, I want to first kind of just back up a little bit and and um, zoom out and 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 just t discuss what is a national monument. Um, and of course, uh, a national monuments have uh, objects of historical, cultural, ecological, and or scientific significance. Um, the Antiquities Act of 1906 um, is what allows um, the presidents of the United States to uh, invoke uh, this this uh, this law um, and enable the creation of these national monuments. Um, these national monuments are federally owned lands. So initially, they it's like there's no private lands. Um, that are being considered, that would be considered for national monuments, only federally owned lands. Um, and so far, 18 U.S. presidents have invoked the Antiquities Act for this purpose. And nine have been Republican presidents and nine have been Democrat presidents. And they all have used their authority to, de to designate all of the existing 161 national monuments. Uh, note, I should I should mention that uh, a national monument um, that is created through a presidential proclamation uh, is different, a little bit different from that created through Congress. So those are the two two avenues that a national monument can be created. Um, the congressional side um, can only be dismantled by another act of Congress. Um, the presidential track, the, 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 that can be dismantled, potentially could be dismantled by a future president. 
Um, and we saw an example of that during um, the previous administration when they tried to rescind Bear's ears. And thankfully, that got caught in, in the court. So that didn't go through, but it was attempted. Another piece to understand about a national monument is that uh, it doesn't come with any new appropriations in terms of funding for it. Um, although we, 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 the existing managing agency would allocate its own existing funds to provide resources for that national monument. Um, so as a, as a hint, hint, um, if this were, if the national, if this national monument would go through as a, um, uh, proclamation through, through the Antiquities Act, uh, uh, sometime in, in, in the near future after that, we would also try to, uh, lobby uh, Congress to increase funding for that managing agency or take on other legislative tracks to secure funding for the area. So um, yeah, there's a lot of national monuments as we uh, mentioned, 161 plus. And um, you know, there's, would love to get feedback from y'all in the chat box and highlight some of your favorite national monuments that you've visited or that you want to visit. Um, national monuments are, they come in all shapes and sizes actually. Some are super, very small um, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, very diverse. So just wanna hear from you all, um, what's coming up for you? What national monuments have you been to that you love? Which ones are on your bucket list? So some of the proposed um, highlights um, that encompass the Chickwala National Monument and Joshua Tree Expansion, um, it's 677,000 acres, 17,000 of which are uh, the Joshua Tree National Park Expansion. And um, the rest, I'm sorry, it's 770,000 total 17,000 is the Joshua Tree expansion and the rest is the actual Chikwala National Monument. And um, another, another important piece um, of the proposed highlights is that it would increase or enhance uh, equitable access to the area. It would obviously uh, blunt the most negative effects of climate change on people, flora, and fauna. And it would also safeguard World War II era trainings, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the future or in this presentation. And it also safeguards the sacred sites of uh, several uh, tri na uh, tribal nations in the area. It also calls for a study of recreational needs um, which would give us more information about access to the to the area. Um, do you all remember the initial definition of uh, you know what a national what qualifies as a national monument against uh, yeah, it's lands with cultural, historic, ecological, or scientific importance. So in these bullets, um, a lot of these bullets fall under that definition. Some don't. Um, I'll mention one that not doesn't necessarily um, fit the initial definition. I'll tell you why it's still in there anyway. It's the enhancing the uh, equitable recreation and access part. Um, we added that piece because it's in line with the current administration's America the Beautiful and 30 by 30 efforts to secure and enhance access. And um, you know what I'll really briefly go into what that means. Um, but we're talking about, or in this case, we're talking about um, ensuring that people of all walks of life um, can experience the outdoors. And uh, that means that um, uh, ensuring that folks don't it, folks can can attend without it being a financial burden. Um, that folks with disabilities can still access parts of the park. Um, and also that the stewards of these outdoor spaces are representative 
of the community at large. So you know, California is very a, a very diverse uh, state, and and so we would want it to reflect the diversity of of the area. Um, yeah, so just some examples of uh, what we mean by equitable recreation and access. Um, and we're hopeful that, you know, we added that because, again, the, the Biden administration um, and the Department of Interior are very much in line with wanting this across the board. And so here's the map um, of the area. Um, the green, the dark green boundary that you see here is the Chikwala National Monument uh, 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 proposed border. Um, the purple area is the, the dark purple with dark lines uh, is the other 17,000 uh, acres that would be the Joshua Tree National Park expansion. And um, the, the Park Service has already, you know, they're very supportive of this. They've uh, provided letters of support uh, stating that um, they would be more than happy to see the expansion happen as it would alleviate some of the um, uh, 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 existing traffic and uh, impacts that they are currently seeing in other parts of the park. This would just help uh, alleviate some of that pressure. And so they welcome that area. And they're, they're basically saying they could uh, manage it. Um, down to the, as you can see, the, the area here, it starts on the west side uh, around the Coachella area, and it goes all the way you know, east, almost to the, uh, to the Arizona border, the Colorado River. And it goes all the way down south uh, into Imperial County and almost touches the, uh, the Mexican border. So it's a, a, a really big swath of, uh, of land that you see here. Um, the other piece that you see here in the, uh, like kind of the gray area on the south side of the boundary is a Chocolate Mountain Air Gunnery Range. And that's De Department of Defense. Uh, they're, they're, they're managing that area. This is where they have like their Top Gun and other military trainings. And they're also very supportive thankfully, because um, they're looking forward to not uh, having, I think someone needs to be on mute, um, having uh, more commercial activity close to their military trainings. So the Department of Defense is also very supportive of our efforts, thankfully. The entire um, boundary is within the 25th Congressional District, which is uh, represented by Congress Member Ruiz. Um, and we're very fortunate that after um, some time uh, and, and co in collaboration with his staff, uh, he came out in uh, late September uh, publicly uh, championing these efforts. Um, so he, you know, we wouldn't be able to move forward with this without the support of the Congress member. Uh, super key in making this happen. And uh, his staff and uh, his office have been just absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, we also have the support of uh, several tribes, critical, the, the tribal nations in the area, um, very critical, as well as uh, various uh, community leaders of all types from, from the area. We all had a great gathering. Uh, 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 media, media was in attendance as well, basically uh, stating that we're, we're moving forward with this effort. Um, the campaign itself started back in 2016 uh, really as just like a vision, a, a vision of, a, of an idea, kind of like a, you know, back of the napkin kind of uh, uh, a thought. Um, some some folks got together. Uh, one of them, which uh, is our very own Joan Taylor uh, from the Talkweeds group, 
uh, and other uh, leaders in the conservation uh, uh, environment um, figured that this was needed. So, you know, this is back in 2016, come 2019 is when you were really seeing a, a, a more traction in terms of more uh, big organizations uh, wanting to get involved and also small, smaller or grass root organizations from the local area um, also supporting this. So um, come 2019 now, so all there's been a lot of movement basically between 2019 and 2023. And I and I and I, I think this is um, a, a typical for most uh, national monument campaigns. Um, there's like peaks and valleys throughout. Um, definitely securing the support of the local community. One of the first things that we did was reach out to uh, uh, to locals through our Sierra Club groups, asking them um, uh, if they would support such a thing. Um, and then using their grassroots know-how to leverage um, uh, uh, their contacts into the local city council members and municipalities. And so we've been able to secure uh, individual city council member support and also resolutions from various cities uh, throughout the 25th congressional district. Once there's enough of a, of a, uh, of a, of a group of support of that type, we then can really go to um, uh, the congressional uh, member and say, hey, we've got a lot of support here. Um, let's move forward with this. And so uh, in September, that's when it really showed that we had uh, done a lot of the back uh, back work on this and uh, the, the member was excited to move forward with the, with the program. Um, there's a bunch of other, you know, there's some, there's some, uh, valleys. Uh, I won't go too 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 into them, but um, certainly opposition. Um, we haven't had as much opposition on this campaign as we thought we would. Although as things go national, we we expect it to 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 come to to uh, the for them to come to the table, and um, uh, we'll have to engage at that point. The point is that we have a lot of good good support at this at this time to move everything forward. So the um, one of the first things that we want to talk about in, in this piece is, is the, the, the outdoor recreation for the communities. And uh, there's a lot of that um, in this boundary. Uh, there's popular places, I'm sure many of you have already visited, Corn Springs, Painted Canyon, Ladder Canyon, um, the whole entire entire uh, Mecca Wilderness area, um, the historic Bradshaw Trail, which we'll also get into in a little bit. Um, a lot of folks love these love these uh, places. Uh, the desert can be absolutely magical, um, and these are just some photos of uh, Congress Member Ruiz uh, visiting with some community leaders visiting the area. Um, he's, he's told us that he absolutely adores the desert. In fact, he's gone to the desert many times to make important life decisions. And uh, one of them was that he, um, proposed to his wife in Joshua tree. Uh, so he's definitely, uh, uh, in tune with the importance of this area and the beauty and power that comes along with it. Um, yeah, you know, I wanted to pause here and just mentioned how important it's been to to really reach out to the the local community and the local community especially around the Salton Sea area um, is diverse um, and so are the the communities um, at the west end um, and they're they're very different and I'll go into a little bit about you know what makes them different and why they would support this the the families living in the in the adjacent cities, um, the ten freeway and the one thirty eight, um, uh, they are experiencing a lot of, especially in the Beaumont and Banning area, they're experiencing a lot of um, of the negative effects of the logistics corridor, um, the warehouse development. It's encroaching into their uh, their neighborhoods. And uh, although 
there's there there there's some pros there's some pros to that. Uh, there's certainly a lot of cons, and the cons include uh, a deterioration in health, um, and also uh, air pollution uh, uh, and increased traffic. And um, for them, that's a that's a really that's a big problem. On the on the other side of the of the boundary, the Salton Sea area, the um, East Coachella Valley especially is a community that has a lot of low income and uh, under resourced communities that have been uh, really negatively impacted also by pollution resulting in asthma and cancer, um, especially uh, amongst people of color. Um, and specifically because uh, dust particles have, have um, uh, moved up into the air um, as a result of the shrinking salt and sea. And this, this, uh, this, when you get dust storms in there, uh, the result is a deadly mix of uh, pollutants and, and you know, to toxic pesticide in the air that gets into the lungs and um, is not good for you know, the most vulnerable people in that area. So what all these communities have said is that they're looking to uh, find a counterbalance to these issues, to their health. Um, to the overdevelopment of their areas. So um, they're looking forward towards the protection of this area. Uh, um, uh, and, and so it was, it, it could only be with their effort um, in helping us to get and secure a lot of local signatures that we were able to move this forward. So just we're just really help, uh, thankful to, to these communities. Here we see a picture of um, the some some Sierra Club volunteers as well as volunteers from El Sol, a local uh, 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 nonprofit that focuses on health, and for them this was very important. So they came out at you know on uh, to a lot of tabling events, um, five a.m. Uh, uh, tabling events. So they they're very committed, and we're just grateful to have those kinds of uh, relationships with them. Um, a lot of our material, in fact, all of our material, including our website, was translated into Spanish. Uh, again, on the Salton Sea area, um, a lot of Spanish-speaking folks, um, and so you know, you we the 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 uh, the uh, asset or the the material that this person is holding in her in her in her hand is uh, a history of the desert tortoise. It's in Spanish. Um, no one ever had approached her. Um, in, in her own language on these issues. And she had no idea. And she became an avid supporter, actually one of our key volunteers in securing a bunch of signatures in the area. So just the importance of being able to connect with the with these people in their own um in their own language or in their in in a way that respects their culture was super important. Um going back to the health, let me you know, we still want to make sure that people get this. Um, 10% of the carbon that is uh, emitted in California is actually captured and stored underground in the California desert. Um, and so this is, uh, this. I wanna shout out to Robin Kabali, the author of Desert Underground, which is where I took the snapshot. Um, and it goes into more detail about the science, basically carbon sequestration taking place over millennia um, and holding this in the uh, caliche underground. So the problem with this is that if you pave over something like that, or if you, you know, you put a bunch of uh, solar panels over it, you're removing the ability for the desert to continue that carbon sequestration. So you're basically chopping off um, the 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 region's lungs in order to uh, develop other things, um, and then the worst part is if if you do too much of this, you're at great risk of releasing that carbon out back into the atmosphere. That all that carbon that has been been held for millennia, you're releasing it back, and that is not good for your lungs for your health. And it and it and it results in some um, um, really de deteriorating health effects, including asthma and cancer. 
Uh, so it's been, yeah, it's been a, a, a process of just a lot of support from a lot of people. Um, a lot of great organizations have, have been helping us. And this is just a really great photo of the, the, the various partners that we've been uh, working with in uh, moving this forward. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the um, that the that the uh, uh, tribal nations um, are 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 key in this, and certainly the the uh, Chihuahua National Monument um, would honor the homelands and the sacred sites of the Kawia, the Kachan, the Serrano, the Chemehuevi, and the Mojave peoples. The uh, tribes, you can see uh, you know, where they're at in this particular map. Um, they're in the, the, like the golden yellow parts. Um, you can see that uh, they're, they're nearby. Uh, these are their, 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 where they have their, their, their reservations. Um, and, but they use, they use this area as, uh, you know, they visit the area within the boundary often uh, for sacred uh, ceremonies and to uh, revisit their indigenous past uh, and present because they, they're still they're still there. Um, and so to date we've secured the, the support of the Fort Yuma Quechan tribe, the Torres Martinez Desert Cahuilla Indians and the 29 Palm uh, Band of Mission Indians. As I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cultural significance uh, for the tribes in this area, um, and there's you know you can see a lot of petroglyphs throughout, uh, and uh, there's it's still being used to this day by many uh, tribes. Um, definitely uh, want to move a little bit into you know at the access uh, you know for everyone in this area. Um, you know, I mentioned Corn Springs earlier. This is a uh, Corn Spring is probably one of the uh, most visited currently for hiking and uh, wildlife viewing. Uh, a lot of birders love this place. Uh, uh, definitely uh, camping is available. Um, and it just holds a lot of different wildlife, flora and fauna included. Uh, Box Canyon is another uh, beautiful place. It's got spectacular views. Um, uh, from the starting out in the, the 10 freeway and it, and you can take it into uh, deep into the, uh, the, the, the wilderness part. Um, it's, uh, it's fully paved. So a lot, a lot of bikers uh, uh, love, uh, you know, parking in the, off the road and just, um, you know, using their bikes to, 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 to ride into uh, the, the areas where they're, where, where that's um, available for them. It's about a 15, mile road that's just absolutely beautiful and you end up in uh, Painted Canyon. Uh, this is a picture of Painted Canyon. Um, it's in the Mecca Hills Wilderness, absolutely beautiful as well. It's about a five uh, mile round trip uh, walking here. Uh, the, the entire canyon is just absolutely breathtaking. Um, there's also shorter hikes so you don't have to do the entire thing. Um, also, Ladder Canyon is nearby. Uh, this is a little bit more for the uh, 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 folks who are into a challenge. Um, although I did, I saw people of all ages uh, climbing up these ladders. Um, really beautiful for, uh, uh, formations that uh, go back millennia as well. And uh, the scenes are absolutely breathtaking. Uh, this is a picture taking, taken uh, we're hiking up the Ladder Canyon Trail. Um, kind of reminds me of a uh, Utah-ish type of canyons um, with the right light. And um, you can see on the left, you can see the trail. It could be, it could get kind of narrow. Um, and you can see the trail like at the bottom uh, of, of, of the individual here to the bottom of, of towards like where their feet would be. That would be uh, probably one of the narrowest trails there. Um, I'll, uh, the, and it's just absolutely, and I, I'm, I'm standing on the picture on the right, I'm standing on a very narrow trail um, surrounded by these amazing uh, historical geological uh, time walls in the back. It's also a great place for folks to just camp out if you're not interested in like going the challenging route. 
um, dispersed camping is available for folks. So definitely access um, um, to these beautiful areas is, is for everybody. Um, definitely the, the, you know, one of the, one of the things that we thought we might get a lot of pushback on, and we're still working on that is the OHV community. Um, there is a, uh, the Bradshaw trail within the boundary, which protects the, uh, legal OHV, uh, tra or road that is also called the Bradshaw trail. Um, that covers 70 miles currently from San Bernardino to Arizona, 40 miles of which are within the Chukwala National Monument uh, boundary. And the, 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 the boundary would protect the OHV uh, usage uh, in perpetuity. So by the way, if any of you all have um, connections to the OHV community, let me know because we want to uh, want to do our best to continue to build and, uh, relations with them and, and, and reach out to them. Um, World War II sites are, are here as well. Um, uh, Camp Young and Camp uh, Coxcomb uh, are here within the boundary. Uh, many of you know that this area hosted the, uh, the Patton Camps, which was a training site for um, uh, uh, close to a million and, and, and plus men um, that went to uh, train to be um, uh, accustomed to the desert uh, uh, terrain uh, in their training to go to North Africa um, under General Patton. And so uh, there's, a, there's still a lot of artifacts out there uh, remaining, um, resulting from the mm -hmm. uh, training activities from the soldiers. And um, when you look at the map, you recall how the, uh, the boundary abuts north to Joshua Tree National Park, creating a huge wildlife corridor. Um, that is a, a very important significance. And Julian first mentioned that this Chikwala National Monument would be bigger than Joshua Tree. So now imagine combining them both, right? And that what effect that would have on the uh, on wildlife, being able to move um, due to climate change, they're needing to find new 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 uh, new spaces and new territories so that they could continue to re rep reproduce. And what's interesting is that Joshua Tree National Park, uh, the Mojave Desert is uh, very different from the lower desert, right? Which is the, the Colorado Desert, which is uh, where most of this uh, is. So it'll be interesting to see um, how wildlife can now have easier access um, to those regions being protected through this, uh, through this national monument. The avian uh, habitat is, is humongous here. Uh, there's more than 50 native species and it's critical for 95% of the birds on the Pacific Flyway that make this uh, an eco stop. We also have flora and fauna um, in this area, uh, native, native plants, and uh, these three, which are endemic to the area, meaning there's no other uh, uh, of its type anywhere on in the world, the Mecca Aster, the Orocopia sage, and uh, Mansus choya. Of course, uh, a lot of wildlife conservation going on. Um, the namesake of the entire um, national monument is the Chukwala lizard on your left. Um, really interesting guy here. This uh, 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 lizard blows itself up. I mean, it inhales a lot of air to uh, blow itself up um, when it when it sees that it's uh, gonna get attacked. Um, it'll wedge itself into rocks and uh, blow itself up, and ma ma which makes it harder for predators to try to remove it and take and 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 take it. Um, so just a really interesting, resilient way of adapting to harsh desert conditions. Uh, of course, the desert bighorn sheep um, and the desert tortoise 
In fact, the desert tortoise, I'll see this, this map, um, three or two thirds of the entire uh, Chikwala National Monument boundary is desert tortoise critical habitat. And you can see that in this map, um, it's the red or pink or salmon colored uh, hashtags. Um, the, the boundary itself is in, is in dark blue. So you can see it's it's almost, you know, almost all of it, you know, is uh, desert tortoise critical habitat. Uh, an important piece of this that we mentioned to a lot of our um, business groups and interested uh, 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 chambers of commerce, things of that sort, is that this would be a boon for our economy. Um, our, the outdoor uh, 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 industry is um, uh, a, a really big economic engine for the state of California. In fact, um, the outdoor industry common economy is contributing $92 billion in economic spending and creates 691,000 direct jobs and is generating $6.2 billion in state and local revenue. And um, the outdoor recreation industry just came out with a with this this report stating that the outdoor recreation industry employs more Californians than the wine and film industry combined. So, a lot of tourists. You know, we were out there. Um, every time I've been out there with uh, friends and family and, and coworkers, we've seen we come across. Uh, more people from outside of the country, um, you know, it's it maybe our luck or whatever, but there's, you know, folks talking other, you know, talking in other languages as we pass them by. And, um, and it's, and so it's, it's, it's definitely an attraction. Uh, one thing I also want to note that uh, in terms of an, an economic engine that in the um, uh, following the 2012 designation of the Rio Grande uh, Del Norte National Monument in New Mexico, visitation to the area increased by 40% and local tax revenue in the gateway community of Taos increased by 21%. So a huge boon to the Chamber of Commerce and the hospitality industry in that area. Similar, uh, similar uh, uh, data for uh, our, the local uh, Southern California, Santa Rosa, San Jacinto National Monument. This particular study was done by Headwaters Economics. Same numbers, um, either it doesn't affect it negatively or it increases the, uh, 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 the economic spending uh, and, and, and helps the, the local economy. One other quick thing to, to mention is that the, you know, the, the, the boundaries do not affect the existing Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan for uh, renewable energy in the desert. So as you, in case you don't know, the DRECP is uh, an agreed upon um, policy that uh, took you know ten years to develop a bunch of the the stakeholders, federal, state, nonprofits, tribal nations came together um, to chime in on this, and uh, it's 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 basically a a uh, a balancing act. Okay, so solar um, in the desert just willy-nilly anywhere is, in our opinion, a bad idea. It needs to be smart. It needs to be placed in the in areas in the desert where it's going to have the least negative impact. And so the DRECP figured out, you know, uh, wh where those areas were. And so that's where we, we want to see solar out, out uh, as well as on rooftops and on top of warehouses and over already uh, disturbed lands. Um, but this boundary it's it's none of it is DRECP. So that's a good thing that we're not encroaching or taking away from the solar uh, development of of our of our area.
just a quick snapshot of the various organizations that are involved in this. This couldn't happen in a vacuum. And certainly uh, we, we're, we're really honored to be counted as one of the Protect California Desert members. Um, but we have a really good diverse group of folks from local uh, groups, um, as well as state and national. So uh, in closing, you know, would love to have your support at this point. Um, again, there's so many ways we're, we're like, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely beyond the midway point of the campaign. Um, we're hoping that we could wrap this up by 2024, right? And um, we still need help. And you can help as it's as simple as uh, signing a petition, uh, letting President Biden know that you support this uh, project. Um, you can go to, you can take a snapshot of that QR code that you see on the left, or yeah, you can let me know and I'll be happy to email you a link. Um, and that's as simple as uh, five minutes of your time, or you can let uh, myself uh, or Marianne know, Marianne's been very involved in helping out, um, that you that you want to support this in, a, a, in, in, a, in another way, outside of just signing a petition. We welcome it all your insights and um, uh, guidance is really appreciated. And with that, I will now uh, pass it back to our facilitators and open to take any questions. Moises, thank you so much. Um, lots of questions in the chat. Um, so let's get started. Uh, and Marianne very helpfully posted links to Protect California Deserts and the uh, the Sierra Club uh, Structural Assessment Recommendation and Report. So we have that in the chat for people to look at. Um, first question, uh, has Congress funded the other recent um, national monuments? What's the funding situation? Because I, I know you touched on um, designation, but Oftentimes we'll have something designated, but there's no funding to administer it, to manage it. What's what what are you hearing? What are you seeing um, from local groups and from Congressman Reese? Yeah, that so it's interesting. So what we currently have is this like a dual track um, for this part for the Chiquala National Monument. We have a dual track that is legislative. Um to, to take it through Congress uh, and attempt to do that while in tandem also moving this uh, towards a Antiquities Act. Um, so it's, it's a tandem dual track. And so there's, you know, moving, moving parts to both. Um, right. And yes, if it is, if it, if it ends up only being an Antiquities Act, as I mentioned, um, it won't, you, you, we won't be able to get any new funding for the area. It'll only use existing funding um, to protect it. And to, it will be protected. There's the funding to enforce it, you know, to add all the amenities, the recreation that we are advocating for um, will not be there. It'll have to be taken from the, their existing funds. Okay, interesting. Um... Okay, we have some some people responded to your question about favorite national monuments. We have Valley's Calderas in New Mexico, San Jacinto, um, Berryessa Snow Mountain, uh, Walnut Canyon, um, uh, Newberry National Volcanic Monument, uh, Sunset Crater in Wapaki in Arizona. Mm. Uh, so lots of favorite national monuments in the area. Um, another question. In terms of equitable recreation, um, are there plans, and, and you were just talking about funding for infrastructure, uh, are there plans for campgrounds, campsites, you know, the camping, you know, car camping is one of the cheapest ways for people to see the country. I mean, when you can pay $35 a site versus 150 for a very Spartan hotel room, I mean, camping is just such a good deal. Um, mm -hmm. 
So are there plans to develop that and develop trails that are accessible to all different kinds of groups, you know, disabled children, cyclists, auto tourists, all kinds of people? What have you yeah. heard? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, so there is a, a, a request for a recreational needs uh, study, uh, which will take into account a lot of the existing uh, trails and access points and campgrounds, uh, and then see how we can build off of that. Right yeah. where where it makes most sense, um, so uh, this calls for that that study, and that would be definitely uh, funded from existing uh, BLM funds. Well, that let me just put in a a, a plug. Um, I'm camping. My my spouse and I are camping over Thanksgiving in Joshua Tree, and we made a backup plan in case there's a, a government shutdown. So we managed to secure a site over in Anza Borrego, but it's tight. There's not a lot available. So uh, the more campsites, the better, um, because people people love it. I We love camping over this time of year. It's so gorgeous out there, but mm. there just really aren't that many sites to be had, um, you know, to go out with friends and just spend some time. Uh, tricky agreed, weather. agreed, yeah. Okay. Um, more questions and comments um really in terms of we a lot of questions about what is meant by equitable access and and i'm assuming that there, that it's partially because this is really one of the closest areas to greater los angeles uh, places like the channel islands are very expensive to access because you have to get a boat ticket um death valley is pretty far away um and and you know a joshua tree is very very crowded at times um during the recent the summer i think it was an it, it was an eclipse or a, a an astronomical mm -hmm. event there was a line three miles long outside of joshua tree it was right. crazy um so just there's a lot of need is is that what people are thinking in terms of access just opening up more land near los angeles yeah, yes, but I think also um, looking at access from the lens of the people, for example, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in East LA, right, not too far from this area. I never once visited, I never, I never even heard of Joshua Tree until much later in my uh, young adult life. I never went, I never, you know, my family just, there's, there's something about cultural gaps that exists that yes well it's just not something that some families do they're not yeah. connected to it they're just not educated about it um if they don't even realize that they can do it right um so for myself um you know i think that you know my parents both only spoke spanish growing up right so i mean and the neighborhoods that we lived in, you know, they 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 raised seven kids only speaking Spanish. So can you imagine? <laughs> it's like, how'd they do that? Well, because they're like in their little, you know, comfort zone, like protected bubble. And there's and anything outside that bubble is scary. It's the unknown. They're not going to go out there. Who knows if they're going to come back, right? Like, they're not going to take family out there. They don't know. So one one piece is like, getting our getting ourselves to see this through the lens of these of families right whether it's you know they have disabilities physical impairments that you know you need to take into consideration like really in the design you know what can you do what can you change to allow some sort of uh, more access to those folks that would normally not come out here oh yeah my my mother was real wheelchair bound at the end of her life and it's scary taking some place somebody out to a place like that where you really don't know about accessibility. Um, so opening yeah. opening opening that up, like you just in even ed, in the educational material, allowing um, that to be uh, out in the community, and also when you do visit, you know the signs. Um, you know, are can can anyone? You know, we get visitors from all over the world, right? So. How can these signs trans be translate, communicate what 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 the what what we're what 
what we're seeing, what we want them to do, the, the, you know, the, um, the wayfinding signs, right? All these things you have to just look at, look at that. Um, there's, there's just a lot of considerations when you put on that, like access for everyone lens. Well, and just economic. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid and my folks camp because it was economical. And even today, I mean, $35 for a campsite, I can get six people. So the two of us and four of our friends, one campsite, two cars, it's a great deal. It's fun and it's cheap. So, I mean, that's... Uh that sounds like a great tagline. <laughs> yeah, I it's mean, it's true. And bring, bring. You could bring your food. No, you know, bring whatever you want, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Make sure that you take it back with you, right? Whatever, like leave no trace. But you know, all these things that, you know, um, it, it'd be great to have you, uh, Julian, in one of our, you know, uh, strategic uh, thinking at, for the design of this. This is you. Have, you bring up good, good points for sure. And whoever brought up, I hope that answered your question and let us know if it didn't, because we can go into it more if, if necessary. Well, many more questions here. Um, what, in terms of your organizing, a lot of interest in your organizing, what cities did you contact? Where did you find your greatest support? What was your yeah. tribal support? What was your union support among farm workers, you know, that are being impacted in so many ways by the dust blowing and by lack of places to recreate and, you know, just to, uh, just needing places to go. Um, teachers, you know, educational opportunities for their students, um, nurses talking about the health problems out in the Valley. Where are you getting your support out there? Yeah. So thankfully, you know, we're not, again, we're not doing this on our own. We have some really awesome people in the, in the coalition that are, that we where where we've built trust amongst each other enough so that we know who can carry what. So, for example, the Native American Land Conservancy, um, and the uh, Audubon Society together have been really teaming up to take care of the aspect of the uh, tribes. Um, without them, we wouldn't have the tribes, you know. And obviously, there's a other team that's supporting them. Um, but every there we 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 assign leaders to every you know kind of category, and sometimes that that category doesn't uh, you know doesn't doesn't get traction. Um, uh, originally, we were thinking about I don't want to get too into the details, but you know originally we were thinking about um, doing doing something specific for the uh, for the farm workers, and um, we couldn't we couldn't move that. And there was some, you know, political kind of maneuverings there, um, where we had a, we we had to, uh, you know, kind of remove that from our plan. You know, the the map that you see here, um, and I'll share it again. Uh, it's got the word draft on it, right? Because this literally, it wasn't always this way. That map. Has, has, has evolved. Um, you know, when you get a lot of opposition or maybe you get uh, some some folks saying, hey, this looks like a good idea, but, you know, this little area right here needs to be carved out, you know, then we have to weigh whether or not we're willing to do that, you know, and we've said, and we've, con we've considered things and we've said yes to some, and we've actually stood our ground on others. So, um, uh, uh, yes, working with uh, the community. I, I think the the surprising, what can I say, um, some of the first uh, cities that came through, Desert Hot Springs, uh, Banning. Um, Desert Hot Springs, how interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of individual support from folks throughout uh, the area, meaning city council members. But yeah, those were the kind of initial initial folks that uh, that came on board and that were very supportive. And the way we did it is it takes time. It takes us being on the ground and like going to the Rotary Club, going to the civic groups yes. and um, connecting with our Sierra Club members on the ground and they give us the lay of the land. They tell us, hey, like this is what's going on here. Here are the movers and shakers. 
And sometimes they introduce us to them because as, as Sierra Club members, you know, you're, you're active, right? So you, you know what's going on in your local community. And so we leverage that. And, um, you know, I'm having lunch with, uh, you know, one of the city council members from Banning at, at Sizzler, right? And over a, a salad, we're talking about this and, and, and they, they, they become uh, local champions of ours. Yeah. Um, but I love the idea of the, you know, the teachers. Um, we have not gone that route, you know, and may, maybe it's because we don't have any, um, we, we could use more bandwidth. We could use more resources in terms of folks who uh, have connections with, with teachers. That's a really great idea. I, 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 I have had teachers come up to me in, in tabling events. In fact, I've had principals come up to me and say, hey, we want this in our classrooms. Do you have a kit? You know, and so it's like on the one of many things on my to do list, right? Like develop a kit, like have these have these materials ready for teachers to share. Um, yeah. Absolutely, that would be really exciting. But it yeah. takes time. It's it's relationship building. Teachers and nurses, man, kick ass. I love them. I I ran I ran for college board about ten years ago, and they are they are wonderful. Um, and you know, at five a.m. That I remember at the five a.m. On a Saturday tabling event, yes, was with as a, I was at a health fair, in uh, I think it was in Thermal. Yeah, we got like five hundred signatures, and uh, a, a a bunch of them from nurses and doctors that were there providing a service, and they loved it. They loved what we were doing. They wanted it, and uh, they became some of our biggest uh, supporters in the area. And they're organized and wonderful. And then. Um... Some of the building trades, if there's going to be infrastructure going in, do they have an opportunity of building some of it? You know, the operating engineers are going to be doing the grading, you know, people that would be building out campgrounds and roads. And Very true. We, we Very true. Thank you. Thank you for um, that. Yes. Um, more questions. Uh, gay community in Palm Springs. And someone piped up that they're part of Great Outdoors, which is the huge LGBT hiking group in Palm Springs. Has there been uh, outreach to them? Because, you know, Palm Springs City Council is legendary. Yes, definitely all, so. All clear. Definitely so, so yes. Yay, yay our community. Um, but uh, have they been helpful to you? They have. Super helpful. Um the LGBTQ plus community uh, has uh, been a, a supporter from almost from the beginning. We do have associations, organizations that represent them on board uh, that have provided letters of support. And uh, yeah, we're just really thankful their, 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 their support has been very important. Um, Just, and, and this is almost like shop talk, but it just kind of popped into my head. You know, Sabrina Cervantes is a prominent assembly member here in the Western Inland. She's, you know, East Vale, Harupa, that area, and she's running for state Senate. But her dad was, I think, mayor of Coachella. Um, has he been helpful? Because they've got, you know, it's, it's almost kind of a dynasty here. It's kind of a generational thing. But I think he was pretty muscular out there in the Eastern Inland Empire or the desert. That would be great. Um, yeah, Cervantes. That would be great. Yeah, because we 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 are uh, we haven't we've been talking to Coachella for a while now, and so um, they haven't they haven't uh, you know said they haven't given the green light on it, and so any help we can get on Coachella overall would be great. Yeah, it's the Cervantes sister. Sabrina is in the assembly. She's running for the state senate, and her sister Clarissa is in the Riverside City Council, and she's running for this the assembly. So, and their dad. I mean, they they come by it rightly. Their dad was kind of like um, uh, Speaker Pelosi and her dad. <laughs> you know, muscular. Nice. Um, other questions. Uh, Phil Ferrante used to be a big hiker. Uh, and he wrote several books about hiking. Um, I think he's in his seventies out in the desert. Does anybody know if, if he's still active? Cause he, you know, wrote about the Mecca Hills. I remember hiking with him back in the nineties, um, uh, when I was younger and he was quite the, uh, hiking specialist out there. Anyway, question for you. Um, 
just talking about um, how Chukwala would hook up in, with uh, the Mojave National Preserve and what the relationship with there. Um, Marianne just just uh, messaged me that um, you know Chukwala touches Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree touches one of the new national monuments, Sand to Snow, and the others, and then that that kind of touches uh, Mojave Preserve. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering the relationship of all these. Yeah, certainly, you know, some of the cities like, um, you know, D Desert Hot Springs came out saying that they would love to be the region that's surrounded by national monuments. Yes. I mean, you talk know, like, about like that's, that's a selling point, you know, um, and, and they are running with it you know that's and it's right you know like they're surrounded by surrounded by beauty right surrounded by uh magic um so uh absolutely it, and we might be um you know one of the few regions that can claim that across the country that has that many national monuments in one area i'm i, I don't have the figures but i'd be i'd be curious to see you know in terms of um uh, uh, acres and, and, and different monuments, you know, how ours would compare to others. And I think we would probably be very unique. Well, and for desert hot springs, what a, what an opener I remember. And, and again, I don't want to talk too much, but when I was a new lawyer, I had a small law firm for a few years and I did code enforcement and housing for various inland cities and Desert Hot Springs was one of my clients. And at that time in the 90s, it was a spa town. It's it's known for its hot springs and it had spas for many years. And, and it reaches out to certain communities that love spa culture. The Korean community is huge for spa culture and some others. And they built that up. I mean, I was, we were cleaning up burnout meth houses in desert, desert hot springs which exploded and burned because they were doing that kind of act you know illegal activity out there well this whole idea of being surrounded by national preserves national monuments what an what an opener in terms of going from just you know housing and spa culture to something really different and bigger i can see that um really being huge you know, for their chamber of commerce, for and for their rotary. I mean, it, it really is kind of surrounded. Anyway, I can go on and on. Um, one thing about the fact that it's it's such a big parcel, it's this big swath of land. Yeah, you know, it 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 goes into the governor Governor Newsom's executive order for thirty by thirty, reaching protecting thirty percent of the state's land and uh, water by the year 2030. And in order to do that, we need about 6 million acres. So we, you know, we can't just do it by small little parcels here and there. They gotta be big chunks. Certainly the smaller parcels, the parks and things like that are, are necessary and needed and we will, that will happen. But we're not gonna get there in the next, you know, seven years unless we, we, we have these, you know, big visions. And so this is in line with uh, certainly the state's efforts for 30 by 30. Secretary Crowfoot has uh, come out and supported this. He was at the uh, September 25th uh, public announcement with uh, Dr. Ruiz. So um, it it fits it fits the 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 needs of our state and and our communities for 30 by 30. Oh, the, one other thing that there was some discussion about was the historic um, protection. You know, that's a big part of the Antiquities Act, if, if that's the way you go through executive order. But the World War II connection, um, several of us have uh, fathers that fought in the war. I know at least two of us. And my dad was a tanker. He, he was in a Sherman tank. And although he didn't train in the desert, he trained in Camp Campbell, Kentucky. I got to say, there's there's an existing museum I don't know if it would be within Chikwala, but it's, you know, further east on the 10 from Joshua Tree. That's practically one of the only places that I've seen Sherman tanks like the one my dad was in. Wow. Um, important to preserve this. I mean, such an important chunk of history. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those folks are, are you know, they're in their 90s and, and hundreds now, getting to be very senior. Um, 
so a super important history to preserve. So I'm glad mm -hmm. that that that's part of what you're you're working on. That's right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the that that, that that Chidiaco Summit. Uh, and there's a museum yes. that you that you mentioned. Um, fascinating place. And and you know, I want to just uh, reinforce that any private holdings in the in in this in this boundary are res is respected, right? Like this is their grand. You know, I don't know if the, this is a correct term, but they're grandfathered in, right? And so um, this only affects federally owned land, existing federally owned land in the within the boundary um couple of other items uh thank you to marianne reese and chris torres um doing the research philip ferrante is still listed under hike leaders for the coachella valley hiking club he's here during the winter months and in boulder colorado in the summer he may be somebody to contact because he's like a hiking expert he's written okay. numerous books um you know hiking the coachella valley that kind of thing if you just go on Amazon, you can pull him up. Ferranti is F-E-R-A-N-T-I. Um, he's the founder of the Coachella Valley Hiking Club. Um, and people have his books. I have several of his books. Um, okay. And uh, I think we're coming to the close of some of our comments. Many thank yous, Moises. Um, and some discussions about dispersed camping um wanting to talk about dispersed camping and and more campsites um so thank you very much and uh i i think this has been just a fabulous presentation moises i appreciate your time and um all of your support and guidance and folks uh thank you for for being present your questions and for your 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 ongoing support make sure that you sign that petition yeah yeah